Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. This week we'll be looking at the international decade for people of African descent. We're very excited to have two of the 2020 United Nations Fellows for people of African descent and co-founders of the Global Black Collective Institute. Thank you so much for joining us. The UN is a commemorating the decade for people of African descent, uniting the world to discuss common challenges facing African descent people around the planet. Today, we'll be looking at the pillars of the international decade, the UN fellowship program, insight from these former fellows, the new UN permanent forum, as well as promising practices and creative contributions to improve daily lives. London, thank you so much for joining us. Could you share a little bit about what it was like to be a fellow and what came out of that, this new global black collective? Oh, yes. Uh, hi, Joshua. Thank you so much for having us. I, it was an amazing experience. Uh, it was a very uh, intense, it was uh, three weeks uh, towards the end of 2020. And there were about 29 fellows from about 14 different countries. And uh, we were trained by UN experts on the international uh, human rights framework and its mechanisms uh, to, um, to sort of give us that uh, information so that we can work to advance and promote the human rights for people of African descent. And after our fellowship ended, uh, a, a small group of us within the fellowship, we came together to form the uh, Global Black Collective Institute Institute. And, and so we are a Black first uh, organization and we're dedicated to the realization of equity for people of African descent around the world, uh, addressing and advancing the human rights of people of African descent through education, advocacy, and promotion. And Ikram and I are both uh, founding members and um, we are very excited to share our work. Thank you so much. Ikram, could you share a little bit about your perspective of the sure. fellowship? Thank you, Joshua, for having us. So my name is Ikram Borsam. I'm a human rights lawyer and a UN fellow and also co-founder of the Global Black Collective. I'm happy to share with you my experience with the international uh, fellowship with the UN. It was very exciting. First, I had an opportunity to meet people, uh, Black people around the world. We speak different languages, different backgrounds. But talking to them, I, I discover actually we have similar interests in almost a lot of stuff in terms of how racism impacts us, but also how we navigate in a world where we are a minority. So that was extremely important experience for me. And so I really enjoy uh, my experience at the fellowship. The only problem is because of COVID, we did it online. So the experience was not as fulfilling as other years. And we hope in maybe uh, in a few years, we'll all meet together because I work with London for months now, since December mm -hmm. on this fellowship, on, on this actually Global Black Collective, and we never met in person <laughs> because of COVID, right? So, but I'm hoping hopefully in the future we'll be able to meet in person. That's so exciting, especially to know that we can overcome even COVID, but still connect with each other around the world and find the common challenges, but also create new creative campaigns, such as the, the exciting Global Black Collective Institute. Uh, no, you, you're completely right, uh, Joshua, because they allow us an opportunity. It, I would say it was a blessing. The COVID was a kind of a blessing because we were able to continue our work online and able to create this amazing organization. Thank you so much. Could you share with us a bit, London, some of the pillars of this international decade for people of African descent and when it will conclude. Uh, yes, and in fact, before I share that, I wanted to share about some of the countries that we came from, um, from for the fellowship for 2020. So that would be United States, Canada, uh, China, Australia, Mexico, Brazil, Peru, so I mean, Haiti. So we, you know, we were, you know, our African diaspora was very well represented um, uh, for this uh, for this uh, cohort for 2020. And so, yes, the international decade for people of African descent. It is the uh, years 2015 to 2024. So we we have just a few years left, and it aims to celebrate the important contributions of people of African descent worldwide, um, advancing social justice. 
um, and and the inclusion, you know, of, of policies to eradicate uh, eradicate racism and intolerance. Uh, there are a few main objectives of the decade: um, promoting respect um, and protection and fulfillment of all human rights for people of African descent, uh, a greater knowledge um, for our diverse heritage. Uh, adopting, you know, national and international um, mechanisms to advance our human rights. And so the three pillars that we work under to advance the international decade is recognition, justice, and development. And so Ikram, if you want, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, so first of all, just to, to go back to the question you asked previously on the fellowship, I wanted just to mention that I was a little bit surprised to learn that only one country funding that fellowship, and it was Russia, uh, which surprisingly doesn't have a lot of people of African descent in their country, because normally you will expect country like a uh, Western country like Canada, US, and other countries who have a lot of a huge people of African descent as their citizen to fund those type of initiatives. So I was a little bit surprised to learn only one country is funding the fellowship and it was Russia. So that was the interesting thing. To go back to uh, uh, what uh, my friend Lenda was saying on the objective of the um, international decade is to ensure basically that those three team recognition to ensure that the right of people of African descent and their equal participation in society in all aspects of, uh, of, of society, the, the, uh, it deals also with the issue of justice how to strengthen the legal framework to ensure people of African descent receive justice. And third, it, it deal with development to promote knowledge of the diverse cultural and uh, contribution people of African descent uh, provide to the, society, the society where they live. For example, in Canada, where uh, we have a minority of people of African descent who live and to recognize the acknowledgement of their contribution in country like Canada. Thank you so much. And of course, if we look at recognition, justice, and development, that links up very well with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, can you share if there's any cool activities and, and campaigns being coordinated around the SDGs? Or if you want to share maybe one of the best highlights or something you really learned during the fellowship that more people should know about? I want to first... Uh, the, I will just speak to the perspective of Canada because I'm Canadian. And uh, one thing that, that happened is uh, when the, uh, the decade, the International Decade for People of African Descent started from 2015 uh, to 2024, it took three, three years for our government to acknowledge and recognize the decades. And that happened because a lot of people, there was a lot of lobbying, but I'm so glad that Canada is one of the countries that acknowledge and recognize the decades. And there was some activity, but there was not enough to be quite honest to, uh, advance the program of activity of the decades. So that's one perspective I would like to add in North America that in Canada, yes, we acknowledge uh, the decade, but there was not a lot of activity. There were mostly uh, local activity than federal activity. So for example, Ontario, which has the highest number of black people in Canada, recognized the decade and there was a lot of uh, uh, activity. In the city of Toronto, which is the largest city in Canada, uh, put in place. They also acknowledge uh, the decade. They also uh, uh, pioneer some of the data, disagreed data collection. So those are some of the themes uh, I will say uh, that is related to the decade. Thank you. London, anything you'd like to share from just south of the border of our great neighbors of Canada? Uh, yes, I I, uh, I know that the United States has not officially uh, ad adopted the International Day Gate for People of African Descent. I know that there has been um, some uh, discussion um, by a few congressional members, uh, but it's not been official. What I am most um, excited about is continuing to educate local communities about the decade, uh, about the activities of the decade, the, the pillars of the decade. And, you know, we still have time to come together as communities to uh, encourage the United States to, uh, to officially adopt the decade. So there is still time. Um, we have, you know, a lot of um, work to do, but I, I do feel hopeful. <laughs> that we can still work together. That's a great point, London. So since 2024 is the end of the decade, what are one or two steps that we can ask people to take 
to honor the spirit of the decade? And what are some results that we hope we could achieve by 2024? Ikram, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, it's actually a great question. And I will say in Canada, the biggest problem people of African descent have is the lack of acknowledgement. As a group, we do not even exist because black people as a category doesn't exist in any legislation in Canada. So that's the biggest problem. I would say that uh, if one thing uh, the decade would allow, or uh, it would be an opportunity for us to lobby for that, because if uh, in order to resolve a problem, you have to first identify the problem. Now black people are incorporated what we call in Canada visible minority, which basically is anyone who's not indigenous and non-white. Uh, so basically everyone uh, is incorporated in that category. So it's hard to address the problem that are unique to black people. For example, over uh, the, uh, the incarceration issue, police, uh, police brutality, uh, the discrimination in education, which is a quite unique to uh, two community in Canada, indigenous community and the black community. And so the, the, that's our biggest problem is if it will be one thing that Canada will take advantage of this, it will be to ensure that we lobby more using the framework of the permanent forum, but also other tools available under the decade to ensure that the government of Canada recognize black people as a distinct group, equity seeking group. Thank you so much. London, how about you? What do you think we could aim for? Yeah, you know, I think um, what we can do here at home is could be similar to what uh, we're doing for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. Uh, we, you know, as the United States has not ratified uh, the CEDAW Convention. Uh, however, there are cities adopting the principles of this uh, international treaty. So I think um, we could we could adopt that um, that when it comes to the international decade for people of African descent, I think local community members, uh, we can continue to educate ourselves on this, on this decade and what it means, the principles, and then we can as a collective community adopt these principles at the local level within our organizations, within our local um, governments, and then, um, and then work our way and continue to talk with our members of Congress to, uh, to officially you know, uh, recognize the decade, but it would really be beneficial for us to start working at the local level and infusing the principles into our work um, and recognizing the unique contributions and struggles of people of African descent in our communities. Excellent points. And you both really alluded to some of the other aspects we're going to get into. One is the permanent forum, and then the other one talking about this UN for human rights treaty bodies. So really, I do appreciate you both talking about the situation on racism in North American context and really bringing it up that people don't think about a lot. And when we look at Canada, most recently, they just finally had put in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples into national law. So that was big. I think that was C-15 legislation. So it's great now that they've taken action on indigenous, maybe we can see more action around people of African descent. And the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is celebrating its 20th year this year, but now we've created a brand new permanent forum. Could you maybe share a bit about the structure of the permanent forum, maybe when it plans on meeting and why it's such an important initiative in international human rights law? I can go if you want. Go, go ahead. Uh, so the permanent forum, it's, I will say, uh, I won't say a byproduct of the decade, but it was part of the decade, was part of the program of activities of the decade. Uh, we, uh, some of our member of the Black, Black, Black Global Collective members participated actually in, uh, in um, uh, and one, one that were elaborating uh, the, the modality of the forum itself. So basically, um, the forum will allow, now so far, the information I have, and I don't have a lot of details, they will have one permanent secretariat. Uh, I believe the Indigenous Forum has four or five, if my memory is correct. Uh, so maybe that will be something that we need to lobby to ensure that we have more permanent staff to work there. Uh, because one person, I don't know how that person will be able to coordinate all those civil society requests. And, um, it was uh, on August 2nd, actually, was a historic day for people of African descent around the world when that resolution passed. 
uh, there was some concern and in terms of all the requests that, uh, for example, uh, our uh, member of Black Global Black Collective and other members who were working closely with the modality of the forum we're working on were not really addressed in terms of financing, for example, and, and also some of the requests uh, in relation to reparation. Those modalities were not fully uh, uh, detailed in the permanent forum. But uh, nevertheless, August uh, 2nd was a historic day for people of African descent around the world. We are hoping that the permanent forum will allow us, people of African descent, uh, a mechanism to coordinate all the efforts uh, in terms of advocacy. Uh, and, and especially in, in, a, in a world where, for example, now uh, Resolution 43-1, which deal with uh, law enforcement and discriminations as a result of the death of George Floyd, those historical documents did not exist prior to uh, this decade, I will say. And that opportunity, I think the permanent forum will allow us a, a mechanism to advocate better for justice and equality for people of African descent around the world. And I believe organizations such as ours, uh, we've noticed while talking to other members, because as uh, Landon explained, we have members who are uh, diverse members, uh, memberships, people around the world. And we noticed that we, People of African descent have the same struggle, regardless whether they are in UK, Australia, Canada, uh, Brazil, or the US. So because of that, uh, one of our uh, plan in the future is hopefully to coordinate our efforts and to learn from each other and see what uh, we can do globally to use the international mechanisms such as the permanent forum to advocate better for the interests of black people around the world. Thank you so much. London, anything that you'd like to add to that? about the uh, yeah. and its potential. Sure, yeah, one of the things I would like to add um, to sort of um, add to Ikram is to talk about, you know, this was nearly a decade uh, in the making. Uh, there has been uh, consistent advocacy and activism around establishing this permanent forum from activists around the globe. And that does include uh, some of the members of the Global Black Collective Institute, but this was truly a global, um, uh, global effort. And, and so the day that the permanent forum was adopted, uh, many of us watched uh, the General Assembly that day. And, and what I've learned is that, again, many, many people in our local communities uh, are not aware of, of this permanent forum. So I still, as for me as being a community organizer and deeply embedded in, in communities in Metro Detroit, one of my goals is to ensure that community uh, is more active and more knowledgeable about this important mechanism and to ensure that we participate in how the forum uh, interacts with the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly and other uh, UN agencies. That's great. Is there a starting date that they have announced or when the first permanent forum would be scheduled? Just wondering as people are trying to get their calendars in order in their community. And then the other important point you talked about was CEDAW and the cities. It is exciting to see human rights cities organizing around the world to kind of take in that gap that exists between the international, the national, and the local and state level. So it is exciting to see that you mentioned cities for CEDAW. One of the other important points is the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. We know CERD has actually indicated they'll be reviewing the United States in 2022. Uh, maybe it's important for people to know a little bit about the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD, also CEDAW, why we haven't ratified that yet. It really brings up some points when you look at what Ikram saying about Canada not, you know, coming so late in the US not yet ratifying certain things. What do you think we could do about growing a culture of human rights in these two countries that are really seen as beacons of democracy and freedom around the world? That's a good question. Well, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, uh, actually, it was interesting to see during our work with um, a coalition of people of African descent around the world on the modality of the permanent forums. We've, uh, we've noticed that there was a few group, a few countries uh, that were really opposed to the permanent forum and were filing a lot of objections. Unfortunately, those country happened to be the country that advocated for him right around the world, the UK, US, um, and Japan. 
Uh, so it was interesting to see in, uh, for the decade, but also for the permanent forum, those were the same countries who were opposed. And sometimes you will notice that at international level, personally for me, that's my biggest takeout from this uh, fellowship was uh, my involvement to, in, in international politics and the UN work. And I've noticed how, for example, in Canada, our government will take extremely uh, progressive uh, uh, position and it was verbally uh, on issue of race. But when it comes to an um, international issue, uh, Canada object to the permanent forum initially, and then later on is abstained. Uh, so it shows really the true color of how the country stands for human rights. So it's unfortunately that a lot of people are not involved in the international community, but that uh, give us a true picture of how the country stands when it comes to human rights. And it also will allow us to use those international forum to influence the local law. And one example, actually, I would like to share is that which a great news is a historical ruling that happened last week. I think it was uh, yesterday, two days ago, the 23rd, I believe, in Nova Scotia. I don't know if you heard of it. It was a decision by the Court of Appeal in Nova Scotia. And interestingly, in that case, the Nova Scotia uh, Coalition for, uh, for uh, the Decade for People of African Descent was interveners. So they had someone to represent their interests. And that person, that lawyer, argued the impact of racism and systemic discriminations and the overrepresentation of Black people in Nova Scotia prison, which is a province in Canada. And what is interesting is, uh, it's the first time in Canada that histo history of racism and systemic discrimination and marginalization will be taken into consideration when a, a person is sentenced during sentencing, which is normally exists for Indigenous Canadian, uh, Indigenous people in Canada, but do not exist for people of African descent. So that, for me, give me a lot of hope that and the connection between international uh, uh, advocacy and international instruments and the impact on direct legal cases here in Canada. And I think that's the future that we all hope will participate in the future. Thank you for that legal development. London, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think what's uh, really important in the United States is for people to um, continue, because I know a lot of people are, to continue to uh, have an understanding and pursue in information on how our leaders are, are interacting um, on the international stage, how we are interacting with UN uh, agencies uh, in other countries, and it's important to understand why the United States has not signed on to most of the uh, core human rights treaties. And even the ones that we have um, ratified, such as CERD, uh, it is important. It really does come back to our work as act advocates and activists. So to ensure that we hold the United States accountable for its commitments uh, to, to what we have committed to at the UN. So even after we are um, uh, seen at CERD and there are recommendations given, we as a community still, I believe, have an obligation to ensure that the United States follows through. So it's, it's continuous work, uh, but it's important work. And that's what I try to instill to uh, young people, particularly when I'm in the community, is how powerful we are uh, as, as global citizens, as U.S. citizens, to use our voices to make that impact. That's a great point. It really talks about that cycle, and it's a cycle of courage and a cycle of compassion, but that we start at the community, we demand our rights, and if at the capital level, in Ottawa and in D.C., it's ignored, then we use the global civil society and the international instruments and then apply that moral pressure to make sure that they do what they've already promised to, and made those promises to their fellow peer nations. And it's a chance then to at least use all the instruments that exist. So we're talking about the, the treaty bodies and that's such a good point, London, and that we're the only country that hasn't ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, mm -hmm. which is absolutely shocking. One of the handful that haven't ratified CEDAW on women. And then out of the nine, the core nine, only ratified three, which is, yes. I know school just started. Three, yeah. So if you look at school starting, that's definitely not passing grade. And no one would think that about the United States. So it's really a campaign to educate and engage and then empower people to make a difference. And that's, I think, one of the exciting things is the fellowship brings leaders from around the world to say, what I'm facing where I might have felt alone, 
I actually have so much more in common with so many people in places I never even imagined. And so one of the things I think that Ikram brought up that I thought was really the most powerful is also resolution 43-1 and how after the murder of George Floyd, civil society and people who are directly impacted and their family members demanded that the UN look at systemic racism and police brutality. Uh, is there anything you'd like to share about that new initiative? We know the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, just shared her report, and we know that uh, there's actions taking place. But it, it's interesting what has happened during COVID around the issue of racism in North America, but around the world. We can maybe conclude with that, Ikram. Okay. One thing uh, I would like to highlight on Resolution 43.1, it's the country that actually sponsored that. It's one tiny West African country, Burkina Faso. So that for me, it's not only the African group in general who sponsored that, but it was started by Burkina Faso. It's, it's uh, hopeful to see how a tiny, tiny little country in West Africa is able to sponsor those type of um, resolution, historical resolution. It also speaks to the fact that African people are really aware and affected by the plight of people of African descent outside Africa. Uh, because uh, I, I'm, I was myself, I'm, I'm myself born and raised in Africa and grew up now here in Canada. So uh, the impact of racism was not the same as someone who was born uh, in, in North America. So that's, for me, it's historical. It also shows the power of civil society at the UN level. And a lot of people uh, always, uh, for example, say, well, what is the point of using the international instrument? But they forget the impact at the international level uh, it will have on countries such as the North America, US, Canada, or Mexico. And if a resolution 43 and the report that will come out actually, uh, it's not implemented, that would be a tool for local activists to use and pressure the government to say, this is an international community that decide those are some of the remedy that need to be implemented in your country. So it's time for you uh, to uh, put in place some protocols to ensure that at least issue of police brutality is addressed in your country. What is interesting also to know that is, you know, it, although it is a problem that originally uh, uh, came from the US, it has an international impact. Uh, you probably saw on TV, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter in Canada, US, and uh, Europe. Syria. Yeah, exactly. Every country. I even saw a clip of uh, people uh, in Iran, where there's a minority of Black people there. Although, yes, there's Afro community in Iran, but it's extremely small. But it was non-Afro, uh, uh, and Iranian people who were also participating. And it's all countries you will never think, even a country like Greece. So this is uh, the, inter the impact is international. Uh, and it's important to know that there's a way you can uh, locally uh, influence using international instrument and international uh, resolutions such as 43.1. London, just an initial idea around 43. And we'll continue this conversation because we know next week will be the 20th anniversary of the World Concept Conference Against Racism that took place in Durban, South Africa. So we'll continue our conversation and a little bit more reflection uh, next time to see where we've gone in two decades. But any initial final comments on 40, Resolution 43.1? Yes, what I will say is that when I heard that Burkina Faso led the African group to demand an urgent debate on police brutality, particularly in the United States, I felt the spirit and power of the ancestors really uh, coming together and, 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 and making this happen. And again, like Ikram was saying, it, it's, it's very, very um, powerful uh, to know that uh, the people on the continent, African people on the, con on the continent are very aware of what's happening in the diaspora. And, you know, it just shows how powerful we can all be when we are coming together to advocate for each other. So I felt the power of the ancestors and they Great. spoke and the voices are strong. And we thank you both for speaking today. And we thank you both for sharing the International Decade for People of African Descent. And thank you so much for joining us on Cooper Union. Mahalo. Thank you.
Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. <laughs>